I love Doggo so much, and I have a feeling that you do as well. That's why I'm very excited to partner up with Embark. They are a dog DNA testing kit, and they are amazing. I've done it on both of my pups. Top shelf. Love what they do. So go to EmbarkVet.com, and this will get you free shipping and save $60 with this promo code RAY, R-A-Y. So visit EmbarkVet.com to get free shipping and save $60 with the promo code RAY. Test your doggos. Find out so much about them. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. Listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Oh boy, oh boy. Thank you for downloading this particular episode of the podcast in which we talk to people who are creating independent art, music, hardcore, punk, indie rock, emo, whatever it is you are into. We are probably talking to people, we, me, let's just the royal we. We are all having these discussions, whether you know it or not. But I have Matt Cawthrain which I am probably butchering his last name, but Matt, forgive me. Matt is the vocalist of the Bronx. He also uh, plays in Mariachi El Bronx, and I love him. <laughs> and I love what he does musically. Following this band and all of his projects, you know, uh, from their inception. And I've been uh, really excited to have him on the show. He's been on my list of people that I was going to circle around at some point and be like, yo, come on the podcast, man. Join this party that we have going on over here. So uh, we did that because they have a new record that when I say they, the Bronx has a new record that's coming out very, very soon. And you need to, uh, if for whatever reason, you've never listened to the Bronx, uh, rectify that immediately. They are a great band. And you should also listen to the Mariachi El Bronx as well, because they are a great band. So yes, let's talk about how you can support the show. You can email me, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. I read all my stuff, try to get back to you in a reasonable amount of time. So go ahead and hit me up there. You can also leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps out the show tremendously. And I know every podcast <laughs> asks of you to do that, but please do that. It really, really helps out. And um, yeah, just tell your friends because that's the best way that this show gets out to the people. The people, I use that in air quotes, it gets out to the masses for, you know, when you're like, hey, have you listened to this podcast? You need to check it out. Um, you know, I don't use any uh, paid marketing. I'm not doing any, you know, big, uh, big deals with anybody. It's just like, hey, you, you found this show. Welcome. We appreciate that you're here. We, the royal we, me, I appreciate that. Anyways, here is the discussion I have with Matt. Uh, we go all over the place. I've known him for 20 plus years, <laughs> and I was excited to reconnect with him, and it was really, really fun. So this is Matt, and listen to the Bronx, okay? Just do yourself a favor. And if you haven't, or if you have listened to the Bronx, they have a new record coming out, so there's reason to be excited. So here is Matt. <laughs> So 
So like we were speaking about off mic, I, even though I am a huge fan of uh, the Bronx and Mariachi El Bronx, and I, you know, I will still always perpetually know you <laughs> as, yeah, Matt always used to come into the Bionic Records in Huntington Beach and hang out. And it's interesting to obviously watch your musical journey over the years and, you know, continue to uh, admire it from afar from that perspective. But no matter what I have known you to be, you've always been that dude that exudes that just like, Hey man, I'm just down to hang out energy. (laughs) And I, I, I mean, I know that is you as a person, but clearly there are different points in people's lives where they could, you know, I guess kind of step into something else, not to say that you're perpetually the same person for (laughs) the past 25 years, but, um, you know, you could have bought into like the egocentric nature of you being the front person for a, you know, a semi-large rock band. Um, (laughs) you know, I realize maybe this is a big question to start off with, but you know, how have you kind of like navigated that? Was that something that was sort of difficult for you once people started to pay attention to, you know, who you were outside of the context of your band? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it's just like anybody else. I've, I've had, I've had my pitfalls, you know, it's like, I, I am, you know, I do, I, I am very much the same person, you know, it's like, I, I, I love hanging out, you know, it's like, they, they always say you should build a, build a career around what you love to do, <laughs> you know? So eventually, uh, you, you know, hanging out turned into, uh, picking up a microphone and, and, and singing in a band with my friends, you know? And I mean, as the band, uh, you know, got bigger and, and, and more well-known, it just kind of, there was, uh, it was more about for me being serious about, uh, you know, my responsibility to the band and, and actually, you know, creating a sustainable life that I wanted to live as an artist uh, more so than it was ego tripping. So, so that's, I guess, probably a plus, but I definitely had my moments, man. I had my moments where, uh, you know, I got lost in the sauce and, and I wasn't necessarily the best person I could be, but thankfully those were few and far between. And, and, you know, I'm able enough, uh, smart enough to be able to, you know, realize those moments for what they are and be humbled by them and, and, and to, uh, to push forward, man. Right. And that's, yeah, <laughs> I think, like you said, the the humbling nature of being like, you know what, like, I, I'm not that cool, even though I yell into a microphone. Like, I'm not <laughs> <Yeah>. that- <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll pick apart more of what you were talking about right there. But uh, focusing on you as a person, uh, I know you were born and raised in the LA area. Where, uh, where in particular did you grow up? Uh, so I grew up in Pico Rivera. Uh, basically, it's uh, outskirts East LA. Uh, right on the back of the uh, 605 freeway, the 605 and the 5 freeway. Um, so basically like uh, uh, Lakewood, where Telegraph Road turns into Lakewood and, and Rosemead right there, there's kind of a divider. Uh, and and that was that was my hood, man. It was, uh, it was an awesome, awesome place to grow up. Um, it was like legitimate, you know, LA neighborhood, man. It was like uh, you know, we had, we, we had the night stalker come through, uh, you know, we had, uh, uh, you know, my neighbors were, you know, heavily into the gang life. And, uh, but it was also, you know, it was mostly a Hispanic neighborhood. So it's obviously like super like family oriented too. So you learn so much just kind of growing up, um, in Pico, you know, I did. And, and, you know, my dad was a guy who, um, you know, had a lot of respect from, from people in the neighborhood and, and was one to look, look out for his family and stuff like that. So, you know, none of the, none of the gang shit really came near us too close. Um, you know, but, uh, but it was there, man, (laughs) it was, it was there. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was a real deal, uh, neighborhood, you know? Um, and I still go back there every now and then it was, it was cool though, man. I grew up right across from a, uh, like a, an elementary school, You know, so I had like, you know, I was shooting baskets at the at the school after school, you know, because it's like I I went to school in Whittier. I didn't go to school in Pico. So, uh, you know, but having like growing up as a kid, if you have a school next door, I mean, it's so dope because the weekends, no one's there. You're out, you know, you're playing in the baseball field. You're, you know, playing against the uh, handball courts and all that stuff. So uh, it was dope, man. It was a cool experience. I wouldn't you know, trade it for the world. Honestly, I, I lived in there. I lived in Pico till I was like, 
I don't know, like 21, 22, something like that. I was there. Mm-hmm. I, I cried like a baby when I left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I find it so, uh, I mean, I appreciate you articulating that because I find it so interesting. Mostly in Southern California, there's, you know, most people know like LA or Orange County, like as these wide swaths. But once you slice and dice and you understand how different these neighborhoods are where it's like you know i could talk to you about the difference between you know newport beach and huntington beach even though most people are just like yo it's the beach and you're like dude it couldn't be more different (laughs) (laughs) very true (laughs) right and then like you where it's like you know pico rivera means something different than whittier and vice versa even though they're less than 10 minutes apart and i think a lot of i guess larger metropolitan areas like yes of course they do have similar uh, notions behind that, but for you to have that really visceral connection to your home city, you know, I, I I don't know if other people have that same experience. Like, you know, whatever coming from the suburbs of Las Vegas or whatever, where it's like, yo, I ride hard for Summerlin. It's like, what? What do you what do you mean? Yeah, I know. It's it's a it's it's a little you know it's 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 different for everybody, and you know, some people you know they they can't wait to leave and all that stuff. And but I, I do have a, a a large amount of pride being from Pico and. And just uh, honestly, it's crazy how, you know, when you like kind of like just, you know, when you connect the dots, you know, with your life as you get older and stuff like that and just seeing kind of what, uh, you know, like when we started the mariachi band, you know, it's like I don't I don't speak Spanish. You know, it's like that one of the things about uh, the band, um, you know, obviously is that we sing in English. And, and that was something that ended up being uh super cool and, and like people didn't even really realize that that wasn't really something a lot of people were doing and it was something purely you know not an accident on our end but we just wanted to be authentic you know it was not something that i was going to do i wasn't going to fake sing in spanish you know what i mean like there's there's no way i'm doing that right so but it's funny but it's like growing up in pico um you know and like having you know so many mexican friends growing up and like you know having like you know, starting playing in high school with the sons of David Hidalgo from Los Lobos and forming those friendships and just being around uh, Hispanic culture and and all of that and the music so much, it, it was like, I, it, it was okay that I didn't sing in Spanish, you know, because it, it's like, it, I, I knew like it, it was coming from an authentic place, you know what I mean? And it's funny how all that stuff just kind of, you know, how it just lines up sometimes in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and especially too, what you're on the surface, someone looking at you would be like, oh, what does this guy have, you know, connection wise to Hispanic culture? But you're like, well, no, like, even though I, my, my heritage is not that I was surrounded by that. So through osmosis, yeah, I go deep. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, dude, I've seen voodoo glow skulls. I know what's up. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But, um, so what was your, I guess, family life and structure like, you know, did you have brothers and sisters and like, was mom and dad in the house? What did that look like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, uh, I have one brother, one sister. I'm the baby of the, of the group. So, uh, and, uh, mom and dad, uh, they, my, my dad passed away about 10 years ago. My mom's still going strong. She's a badass. Uh, but family life was good, man. It was, uh, you know, it was, it was typical, I think for that time, it was just like, you know, uh, both parents working, you know, just like, um, you know, mom just busting ass, taking care of the family, um, you know, dad working and, and, and bringing home the, uh, you know, the, the, the paycheck and, and that sort of thing, you know, and, and we were allowed to just kind of, you know, I was, I think when you're the, the third kid by that point, you know, it, it, the rules are pretty loose, you know? So it's like, my parents, my mom especially did such a great job of like, um, you know, like guiding me without like guiding me. You know what I mean? Like she kind of like parented from afar. She let me do what I wanted to. She made sure I knew what was right, knew what was wrong. Um, and of course, you know, if I stepped out of line, she would be the first one to tell me, but, uh, she also didn't really place any like, you know, stiff like barriers on like you know what i wanted to do or what i wanted to try or or you know the friends i had or or you know whatever it was like life was was there to be lived you know and so uh it was a really cool experience growing up it was a lot of fun um you know my my brother and sister i think they had a little bit more rules in place so they were you know they they kind of took that out on me a little bit you know saying i had the the easy uh the easy right. road but uh <laughs> 
but you know, it's not my fault for being born when I was born. <laughs> no, right. You're, you're, you're bringing up the rear, you get away with murder and that's yeah. totally fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's how it goes. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> um, and I know that your uh, introduction to independent music was more on the you know metal side of things. You, how did that, I guess, start, start to infiltrate your life? Like, you know, was it your older siblings that were showing you, you know, Judas Priest and stuff like that, or yeah. how, how did that navigate? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my my brother probably has the you know we're we're like super close. We're pretty much best friends, but he's got uh, like hands down the worst taste in music uh ever like when he was he was listening to you know he uh was kind of big in the church for a little while so he was listening to a lot of like really really bad like uh like 90s christian music like michael w smith and like dc talk dc talk and, like, yeah. all this, like, <laughs> right. shit. oh my god it was so bad it was so bad but thank God, thank God for my sister, because uh, she was uh, she was down with the devil, and uh, she had, uh, you know, she was like a KNAC Sunset Strip girl. Like she had all the awesome records, all the hair metal records, all the metal records. Like, uh, you know, she got me into music pretty much uh, just by you know going through her records and you know Metallica, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden. Uh, but it was also, uh, you know, like I'm a huge uh, glam rock guy. Like I'm, you know, like Sunset Strip stuff, like, you know, obviously Motley Crue, but bands like Poison and all those. But like I grew up on that shit. Like I, I love it. And so uh, and that that was kind of my intro, you know, so so I got in to music that way and then kind of. You know, I, I, I kind of maybe slightly dabbled in classic rock, but not, I never really got like all the way into classic rock. I just kind of like went from, uh, from metal and, and, and glam rock into kind of into punk rock. And then from punk, I explored more of the indie stuff. And then indie kind of led me back around, uh, to like, um, you know, folk music and like uh, maybe a little bit more of like classic rock type stuff, you know? Um, but it all started with with metal and glam, man. Nice, nice. And so I, I'm going to guess that uh, as you're, uh, you know, f- we're making friends and whatever, you know, ele- late elementary school, junior high, early high school, um, did were people kind of like, what the hell is this kid? Like, what's it, what's he getting into? Or was it one of those things you obviously also had, uh, yeah. you know? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was like, I was like, I was basically like Joe Dirt, you know what I mean? It was, it was like, but it was, I didn't have like that bad of a mullet, but you know, it was like, uh, you, you know, there wasn't that many, you know, kids that were into uh, what I was into at that time. And, and honestly, music was a big part of my life from an early like age, you know, and it wasn't because I was playing an instrument or anything like that. It's just like, I just listened to a ton of it. You know, I just, I just loved it. I used to, uh, tape, uh, you know, tape the radio station. I would listen to KNAC used to have, they used to have mandatory Metallica every Wednesday and they'd have this show called the punk 60 with hardcore Hillary, like every, every night or not every night. Like I think it was every Wednesday night actually at midnight. And I used to tape those shows, man. And I would call up and I would like win tickets to go see like gutter mouth and stuff like that. Oh yeah. For dude, those, cl- those classic radio show giveaways. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, dude. But I do. I, I loved it so much, you know, like I, and, and honestly, um, you know, like skipping ahead a little bit, like getting into like high school time, like that era of like nineties, like skate punk, which is like, cause for me, I felt, you know, there's a whole generation of, of punks like me who, they have that guilt because they missed the first wave, you know, they missed, uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the first, second waves of, of, you know, West coast punk or like, you know, I mean, of all punk, but, you know, specifically speaking, you know, Los Angeles, you know, with the bands like the weirdos and then like, you know, fear and black flag and circle jerks and all that stuff. I, I was too young for that. So I came just on the edge of that. And I was, you know, I couldn't see any of those bands play live. I mean, unless they were still going, you know, and a couple of them were, but, um, you know, bands, you know, for me that were super huge were bands like 
uh, you know, Bad Religion and, uh, you know, bands like Pennywise. And obviously I loved all the old school LA stuff that was like the Bible, you know, it was just like, but the stuff that I could go see, the stuff that, you know, I could, you know, mosh to and stage dive to, uh, that was all, you know, 90s kind of skate punk type shit, man. And I, I, I mean, it was, it was an awesome, awesome time to go to shows, you know, cause it was just, a, it was so much fun. Right. It, no. And I think it's really difficult to articulate that time period of when these bands were about to, you know, quote unquote break or whatever. I mean, obviously it doesn't you- dude, it doesn't get the respect it deserves, dude. It's like, it, it, <laughs> it, it really doesn't. It's like, cause I know, I know, you know, you can go back on some of those bands and some of those records and you know, it might sound dated or it might not hold up as, as much as you hope it would. But man, I, I, you know, I think a lot of, I have so many friends, dude, that just like to completely deny that they like ever listened to like certain bands, you know what I mean? And I'm like, dude, shut up, you know? Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't pose. Yeah, right. You totally, it's like, especially if you lived in Southern California, it was almost part and parcel that you had to listen to not just like the, you know, tier a God bands of, you know, your bad religions and stuff like that. But you went so far down that rabbit hole where you're like, dude, I love this joy killer record, bro. Like you're yeah, going everywhere. Yeah. yeah I was, I, and, and, and a big part of that, you know, like Dr. Strange was great. Like that band Zoinks, that band Zoinks was so yeah. good. I was into, I was into them. The bull uh, weevils. Yeah. Yeah. The bull weevils <laughs> were great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there there were so many awesome bands from that era, man, and it's like, yeah, I, and shows honestly were so were so much fun, man. They were, oh god, they were so great. It was yeah, so fun, great. I remember one time, uh, my buddy Andre I went to high school with. We literally we went to go. I think we were going to see. Uh, I think it was Glue Gun and Gutter Mouth or something like that. And literally, my my buddy was. Uh, you know, we were in a fucking high school, man. We were young and my buddy was uh, Armenian and we literally just walked into this show. I, it was somewhere in Riverside and we didn't get two steps in the building. He just gets punched in the face by some giant Nazi. And it was just like, God damn. And then, th- but that was it. It wasn't like they punched him in the face and they stomped him out. They just, this guy was just hammered, just punched my buddy in the nose. We take a look at these dudes. There's no way on earth we're going to fucking fight these guys. So my buddy just kind of, you know, assesses the damage, looks at his face and he's fine. And so we just kind of like found our way, you know, to the bar and tried to scam some drinks and, and, and right. went, on with, went on with our evening, <laughs> you, know, you know, and it ended up, it ended up being cool, you know? And, and there, uh, yeah, I was, I remember that was a show with this, this band, the humble gods they had. And yeah. I think, I, I think they were like part of like what became, uh, the Cottonmouth Kings, maybe. Yeah, for sure. They were. I, yeah. I, yeah, one or two of them was loosely affiliated and or played with Cottonmouth Kings for yeah, sure. But they, dude, they had. Okay, so they it was so because the band was terrible, but mm-hmm. they had this. They had this setup where they were playing live, and they had this huge, like, just like roided out, like psychopath dude. Okay, like, uh, like this guy just looks like he's on PCP. And he's just like, there's, there's, his eyes are just dead. And they got this guy, he's, he's got like a, you know, he's got like a wife beater tank top on. He's got like dicky shorts on and he's got this spike collar and they got him, they got him chained to the kick drum on stage. <laughs> they, got, they got him chained to the kick drum on stage and he's like just out of reach from the front row. So the whole set, he was just like clawing at the front row and like trying to like pull himself off the kick drum. But it was like he it was like he was like a real maniac, you know? It wasn't like anything. It was like, man, if that guy gets loose, we're all fucked. Right. <laughs> you, Dude, that's inc- <laughs> Dude, it was it was amazing. It was such a great move for such a terrible band. But right. I'll I'll never forget it. Dude, for sure. I mean, that's ba- that's basically like uh, you know, Bobo from a veil, except like a bad yeah. version of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. That's incredible. And, and, and so I'm going to guess like as you started to develop your, you know, identity and who you were, I mean, clearly it was rooted in music, but you know, was there ever any other consideration as far as a quote unquote life path was concerned? Was it like, oh, I'm going to get a degree and I'm going to, you know, be an accountant or I'm going to follow in my father's footsteps or whatever, you know, that, that sort of path. Did anything unfold to you or was it always just kind of like, well, 
I'll figure this out once I get to there. No, yeah, there was no when it came to like uh, like an alternative life. Like there was no real uh, any sort of drive or detail. It was just like a basic kind of vague, like you know, I'll get a job and I'll I'll figure out you know I'll figure it out from there. You know, it's like I had so many different odd jobs. You know, I, I I worked at Disneyland. I worked at Knott's Berry Farm. I worked for a bank. I worked for mortgage loans. I, you know, worked for frozen yogurt companies. I did, I've I've done it all. You know, so it's like I, I just kind of in in that aspect, I'm so fortunate. Um, you know, to have found uh, kind of a, a, a way into the music industry as more than just a fan, because um, it really I, I had no. I had no desire to do anything else or, or to like go anywhere else at that time. I mean, you know, now in, in life, you know, when you have the luxury of like looking back or like thinking about what you, you know, what you would have done or whatever, it's like, there was, you know, like I almost joined the Navy for a split second out of high school. I almost, you know, did this, did that, but it's like, uh, it, you know, like I, I was, I, I was truly lost as a kid in that respect. Like I didn't, I, I hated school, you know, all I wanted to do was hang out with my friends and I hated authority. I hated religion. I hated, I wasn't afraid to work, you know, like I, 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 what I, was, I would show up to work. I would work hard. Uh, you know, I, I didn't mind doing like, you know, like I, I, I washed dishes I'll, I'll do, there was no job too good or too big or too small, um, in that respect, but I just, it was all means to an end. It was all means just to, you know, you got to get a job because you got to have money to go to shows or you got to have money to be able to party or whatever, you know, it was that, that was my, a job it was just a means to an end. There was no thought on career. There was no thought on any sort of life direction. Um, you know, other than, uh, you know, hoping that, you know, some sort of, wormhole would open up in the in the world of music and and, and it did so i got right <laughs> yeah well I, I think there's a difference between centering your life around music as far as like just having like you said all these sort of transitory jobs where it's like all stuff that i can dip in and out of as i see fit if tours pop up or whatever as opposed to okay well i need to head down the career path because like i need insurance or whatever yeah 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 uh, the uh, I know your first your first band that you've articulated in you know other interviews as far as Pocket Full of Lint, which is clearly an incredible band name. Like I can just close my <laughs> I can close my eyes and hear what you guys sound like, which is great. <laughs> Rockabilia, you know what I'm talking about, right? Band merch. You need to care about band merch because I mean that's that's how this whole thing goes around, right? You know, it's really cool that bands put out records, and that's obviously great. But band merch, holy moly! I mean, I collect both records and band merch. So I'm kind of their target market, but you first of all need to use this code 100 words that gets you 10% off your entire order. And then you will go to rockabilia.com, have fun, shop to your heart's content, and you will be buying officially licensed high quality merch from one of the best places on the internet as far as I am concerned. And you will agree with me because they will ship it to you fast, friendly customer service if you have any issues. Like I said, officially licensed stuff, the bands get paid on this. It is a very virtuous cycle that works for everybody. And you can find everything under the sun for your friends, your family, yourself, whatever your favorite band is, you'll be able to find an absurd amount of merch on there. So I love Rockabilia. Continue to support them and they're supporting the show. It just means a lot. Like I said, virtuous cycle. It works very, very well. So rockabilia.com, 100 words is the promo code and enjoy the band merch that you will buy. The holidays are descending upon us. Everyone is running around like crazy people trying to get their shopping done. Let me just solve that problem for you. No one is ever going to say no to this gift. And this gift is the Raycon wireless earbuds, headphones, or speakers. I love all of these products unequivocally. I use them every single day. And what makes them even cooler? They have 54 hours of battery life. They have a very comfortable fit. They will not fall out. I love them so much. They also have these rad holiday bundles. My personal favorite is the Audio Lover, which includes the Everyday Earbuds and the Everyday Headphones. 
So please, right now, go to buyraycon.com slash ray and use the code earlybf to get 20% off site-wide. That's 20% off of any Raycon product, which seriously never happens. Or you can save even bigger and get 30% off of Raycon's exclusive holiday bundles. That audio lover thing I was telling you about? Do that. That's code earlybf at buyraycon.com slash ray for 20% off your Raycon purchase. Buyraycon.com slash ray and solve all of your holiday gift giving problems for your dad, your mom, your brother, sister. I don't care who, put it in their stocking. They will love you. Buyraycon.com slash ray, code early BF. Did you attend like you know, uh, religious schools all the way through elementary school and high school or was it just high school? Yeah, no, it was all the way through. So it was basically, I went to Whittier Christian, which was like elementary, junior high and high school from basically from like, oh man, I want to say like maybe third grade, third or fourth grade on something like that. Like it was, it was the full, it was the full ride. And then, uh, but I didn't graduate from there because they kicked me out my senior year because they thought I was selling drugs. So I, I ended up graduating. <laughs> I ended up graduating at some wild, like halfway house. <laughs> sure, continuation school or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that that's interesting because I mean, I de- I went to uh, Orange Lutheran High School, and I definitely remember uh, playing your school like sporting events where I played basketball. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I definitely yeah. remember that. Um, did you feel? Uh, I mean, like you said, you're. I mean, when you were joking around about your brother being super into Christian music and stuff, did you feel? Uh, I mean, clearly, like you said, <laughs> your sister. <laughs> was, uh, you know, a fan of the devil. So, you know, she was introducing you to music. I guess you cl- did not feel a pull towards religion and everything like that, or is that just something that kind of existed alongside of you and was something you weren't that, uh, you know, passionate about? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, early on, I, you know, it was just like, you know, you go with your family and it was cool. But as soon as I kind of developed any sort of like, um, you know, not even critical thinking at that age, but just like, you know, individual, you know, thoughts of, of, of religion or, or church on my own. I just wasn't into it. And I, I'm not, it's not like talking super shit on it. Cause I just, I just, I just always kind of thought it was, it was corny, you know, like I, I just wasn't really that into it. And then on what happened on top of that was, you know, in, 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 at that point when I was really like, forming my own identity as a person and becoming more and more aware of, you know, the, the, the people around me, the organizations around me, the, the, the life around me. Um, you know, at that point there was a, a time, uh, in the, in the Christian church where they were super, super judgmental and, and super mean. I mean, like the, you think about, you know, shit that they would say back then, uh, about, you know, how, you know, gays were going to hell about how every, like, basically everyone was going to hell. And, you know, that was just something that, uh, that really pissed me off, you know? Um, and it became something that I, you know, that it, to the point where, you know, I, I was like mad at school every day. It's like, and you gotta, you go to high school and your first class is Bible. Uh, and, and, you know, you start your day with, you know, how, you know, you can't have friends that are gay or that this person, because they have a different belief, uh, is an idiot and they're going to hell and that this, you know, like all this stuff that was so uh, super heavy and super judgmental. And they would, they were, you know, make a point of it to be like, like almost comical in a way, you know, like they were so right. And it was, uh, it, it was just something that really didn't sit well with me. And so, you know, already, you know, growing up, you know, thinking, you know, church was kind of corny and that that whole scene wasn't really me. And then when it took a turn, uh, you know, into kind of really being a, a place of, of, you know, nonstop judgment of, of other people just trying to live their lives, um, you know, that was when I just said, all right, this isn't for me. Right. Yeah. You're like this. <laughs> I, I get you to a point, <laughs> but then, yeah, I'm, I'm tapping out here. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So as you started to, you know, play in bands and start to figure out where you kind of fit within the musical context of, uh, you know, the early early bands that you were doing, were you always singing or did you sing, play guitar? Like, how did that evolution happen? No, I was always, uh, I've always been a a standalone singer. You know, I I think, uh, 
eventually, you know, if I, God willing, I, I, uh, I, I stay alive on this earth for long enough to hold a guitar while I sing, uh, I'm, I'm sure that will happen at some point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when I first started out, um, you know, it was just, and honestly for the, <laughs> for probably, I mean, through the first band, through the drips, through, uh, in the early Bronx stuff, I mean, my main, uh, it was just kind of search and destroy, you know, it was just like, I didn't really, all the things that I loved about, about punk rock and about punk rock singers, um, you know, were, were guys and, and, and women that just, uh, you know, annihilated the crowd and just, you know, just created chaos, you know? So that's the school that I came from and that's kind of all I wanted to be, uh, you know, and to a certain extent, it's all I, I, I still want to be, you know, I think that as a, as a, as a front man, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a lost art because there's so many people who do it great, but it is an art and it's, it's one that I take seriously. And it, it's one that I, I really, really love. I mean, it's the coolest thing in the world to get up in front of the crowd with the microphone and, 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 you know, be able to like play music with your friends, but also just kind of be, be the one who's like kind of, you know, in charge of the energy, so to speak, you know, and, uh, that's like a, a heavy responsibility and it's, it's so much fucking fun. Uh, and, and so that was kind of, you know, how I've been from, from the get go, you know, and it was, it was just because I was so shy and so insecure and so uninformed about being any type of singer, you know, I mean, I, I just didn't really know what to do, but I, I'd heard enough music growing up to know, you know, kind of how to carry a tune and kind of how to keep time. So, you know, in, in, in in that time that's really all that was needed <laughs> right, right well i, I mean the, the joke the joke is especially you know within the punk and hardcore context that usually the singer is the person that can't do any of the other instruments so it's just like exactly. hey matt you're you're kind of loud so you could probably do this right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly you know it's like yeah it's 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 but it's a cool that I'm down with that. You know, I yeah. mean, every, everyone's got, you know, it's like, everyone's got their, their little role and, and their, their spot to fill, man. And it's like, that's why it's like, I, you know, it, it's always a trip for me when, when you see people get super egoed out, you know, cause it's like, I, I just, I, I've never, uh, I've never really understood that. And, and just for, you know, especially in, in, in a punk band type of dynamic, you know, it's like, um, you know, uh, we're we're all the same <laughs> you know so yeah. so i i'm doing something guitar player is doing something bass player is doing something drummer is doing something you know e- each one is is pretty pointless without the other so um you know it was it was always it's always been something that i you know uh as minor as it might sound on on a on a cosmic level I feel like it was something that i was uh you know born to do and and put on this earth to do and I just feel like the way I kind of fell into it and, um, you know, the way that I've been able to, uh, kind of own it on my own level, uh, is, is proof of that. So, um, I'm happy to be, to be where I'm at, man. I'm happy to be a singer in a band. I fucking love it. Yeah. (laughs) You're like, uh, otherwise you'd be uh, fooling yourself over a long period of time. (laughs) (laughs) The, so as you started to, you know, like the, the Bronx started to become, you know, a thing, I always found it really interesting because the, the bidding war that existed over you guys. And like, I distinctly remember it just, you know, working at the record store, but also working at the record labels and, you know, being a kid or being, you know, in tune with the industry. It was so interesting because people were, you know, I mean, it's like obviously from our mutual friends and like thrice and like all these bands that were getting signed and there was so much heat going into you guys of like, oh, Bronx, like this is the next big band. And I'm sure that there was so many interesting, uh, you know, angles that were being approached to you from that perspective. How, I guess, how were you kind of approaching the business as it was, you know, all this wild stuff was happening towards you and ultimately you guys ended up signing with Island. But, you know, was that just a, a bizarre ride from start to finish in that, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that courting period? Yeah, man, it was, it was, it was completely insane. I mean, it was, it was such a, 
an awesome experience, um, you know, in, in the thick of it and looking back on it, you know, it was such a cool time for the band. I, you know, I relied so heavily, um, on, on Joby and Jorma and James, um, in, in the early days of the band, because I was so, uh, uh, just kind of raw as, as a human being. And I had no real experience in any sort of professional environment. Um, those guys, uh, you know, our, our original drummer Jorma had been on tour before and he was in a band that was, you know, relatively successful around Orange County. And Joby was at that time, uh, you know, he, I mean, he's, he goes, you know, way back with, with graphic design. And so he was doing graphic design at Vagrant. Um, and he was in the mix of that whole, you know, boom that was going on there. Cause they had a, a crazy couple years, man. I mean, they were crushing it. Um, uh, and, and James worked there too. And, and those guys, um, you know, I'm not saying they had it all figured out because they definitely didn't. We had, we had, uh, you know, we had, we started with three songs, you know, we got these three songs and then, uh, our drummer Jorma had a friend, Pablo, who worked with, with Jive and, and Pablo was a friend with this guy, Jonathan Daniel, who was, he started crush management who, you know, now they're just, they're insanely massive. And, and Jonathan is a, a, just an insanely talented guy and, and Pablo as well. Um, but we were super fortunate in the beginning to have those guys and they have, they had the Bronx mentality. Like they wanted to fuck with people just like we wanted to fuck with people. And so, you know, the beginning the whole idea was just to confuse people and that people want what they can't have and so we were just going to fuck with people and we were going to leave it up to these two to to build a storm in the industry and create the buzz i mean we had fucking like i said we had three fucking songs man and it's like you know maybe we had played those songs i mean i don't even think we played a show yet right <laughs> like yeah we played we played our first show and it's not like like i'm saying it's not like you know, I want people to get the wrong impression because it's not like, uh, you know, I always laugh when people think that like, you know, when punk bands were just like, you know, oh, this band was like created in a lab or something like that. You know, it's not like we had zero musical experience or were like plucked from, you know, by Simon Cowell or something like that. Yep. It wasn't that type of situation. It was just that we were fucking brand new. And it was like literally when you know, at that point, Joby and I had been playing together for, you know, maybe two years, something like that with the drips. And, and, and so I was pretty comfortable around him. Uh, and he's the guy who, you know, he, he started the band, you know, it was his idea to do something different. And he wanted to do something a little bit more angular than the drips was doing. And, and, you know, Jorma was a perfect drummer for that. And, and James was the perfect bass player to start the band with. So, uh, you know, so he got those guys going and, you know, Joby brought me in as, as, as a singer to try out, you know, and, and, uh, and the one thing that, you know, I'll always attest to is that, you know, it, it's at, even at that time with, you know, playing in a band, but, you know, you, there's so many levels it takes, you know, at least in my experience to actually take music seriously as a kid, you know, you like go through so many different stages where you're just, partying with your friends and playing covers and doing the shit you're supposed to do, you know? But, you know, it's like uh, you get to a certain point when you do realize you see all these amazing bands and you realize that it's all about fucking chemistry. And it's not just about, um, you know, there's chemistry and playing with your friends, of course, but there's, there's also like a level up like professional chemistry where you just, it just, it just feels different you know and it's like when when i i got in a room with those guys for the first time and we played a couple songs together we you know we played like a drip song we we jammed like a, a couple bronx ideas and uh man it just felt uh it it, it just it felt like i'd found you know i i found like a like my purpose you know like i had found like what i was supposed to be doing and who i was supposed to be doing it with and, and so it was a really cool experience. And so we take that and, you know, we have, you know, these three songs, which, you know, are, are an awesome, you know, the, the first record is, is made up of just, uh, you know, so many just, just awesome tunes that I just, I love, you know, and, and it's like, you have that. And then we're able to give that to Pablo and to Jonathan and, you know, 
they know us. They're stoked about what's happening for us. They get and they understand the feeling that's going on between us, the energy, the chemistry, and they know that we're down for whatever they're going to put in front of us. So they went to bat for us and they fucking, you know, they, they got the bidding war going. We got all these labels emailing us. We're sending them back, you know, Morris code and all fucking mailing them all sorts of bullshit, (laughs) anything, anything, but telling them that we're interested, you know what I mean? And in the meantime, you know, like you're saying, bands like thrice bands, I mean, everyone was getting signed. Everybody was getting signed. And dude, I mean, do you remember when that band Vendetta Red got like $10 million or something like that? Dude, it was, it it is. (laughs) I mean, it's funny because it's like, it, it really does feel like I imagine bands felt like in the mid nineties when the yeah. grunge scene was exploding, where it was like, you're looking for like, you know, ostensibly C and D rate bands of whatever carbon copy and not to throw shots at those bands, but it's like, you're, you're just, you're just going hog wild here. <laughs> yeah, no. And that's, that's, that's literally what it was, you know? And it was like, and, 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 you know, again, shout out to, to Pablo and Jonathan because, you know, they we got a, a great deal with Island, and it was a deal that was what the band needed, which was like it was time for us to grow. It gave us time to grow and be a band and, and tour and get tighter, and you know we'd put our first record out on Ferret and all that stuff. And it was like it was super smart, and it was a deal that made sense financially. We didn't go. He's like, you know, the thing I learned early on is that you know the more money you take, the more money you owe. <laughs> You know, right. it's like, this is not, this is not just free money. You know what I mean? Like you get to a certain extent, you get signing bonuses and stuff like that, but you know, it's best to just, you know, it's like, it's tough because you want to, uh, you know, you never want to price your art too low, you know, but at the same time, um, with certain things in life, if you get greedy, um, you know, sometimes it, 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 it can come back and, and bite you in the ass. And, and, and we had, we structured ourselves a really good deal with Island and, you know, even though it didn't work out with them, um, you know, we got the whole second record experience, um, with Michael Beinhorn and it helped launch the band and put us through the ringer, um, to where, you know, we really, uh, you know, there was no stopping us after that, you know, it was just like, I think the the thing about this band that I love, uh, you know, is the foundation, you know, the foundation of the Bronx is, is it's a fucking rock, man. And it's like, we've been through a lot, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Jorma and James are no longer in the band. You know, we got, uh, Brad Majors on bass. We got Ken Horn on electric guitar. It's been that way for, you know, well over a decade now we got Joey C on drums, you know, and, and 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 the band carries on but it's like uh you know there's so much stuff that we've been through um you know on uh you know indie labels major labels our own labels um you know that we've kind of you know we've learned how to how to how to manage ourselves on on any kind of uh on any kind of ring of the ladder and it's one of the cool things i always wanted to be um you know one of the things as a person that I, that I've always wanted to be. And that I kind of like, um, you know, pride myself on is being someone who can, um, be comfortable in any room, you know, like I, I can talk with drug addicts. I can hang and party with the best of them. I can hang in a business meeting. I can deal with socialites. I can deal with, you know, homeless people in the gutter, man, because I, I just, I'm, I'm grounded that way. And it's like, I always wanted the band to be grounded that way. And that was always kind of a, uh, a common goal uh, within ourselves that we didn't really talk about too much, but it was just something that was always there. And, you know, being able to, you know, to, to go on stadium tours, being able to, you know, put out your own record, being able to tour in a van, tour in a bus, uh, headline, um, you know, survive van accidents, you know, just like lose, losing members, you know, gaining members, um, you know, having zero money, you know, uh, running against, uh, you know, into creative walls, you know, where, where you don't know, like a lot of people just think it's easy to write a record. It's fucking hard. You know, you get, you get three records in, you're like, where the fuck do we go now? Right. So, uh, you know, so all of that, man, it's just, it's something that, um, you know, we care so much about the band and it's, it's, it's something that we've poured so much of our lives into, 
And it's something that has given us so much back. So um, it's a very strong tie, you know, between between uh, the Bronx, its members and, and just music in general. Um, you know, so it's it's been a, a long, crazy road, you know, to get that way. But those early man, it, the way it started um, it was so key for us because it, it, it started in a real way. And it, it was started in a way that even though it was on the very edge of all that, you know, at the drive in signing bonus madness, you know, it was structured for us in a way that made sense to be a working class band and to build a foundation that would last, you know, for years and years and years to come. So, um, you know, I, you know, all that being said, we got flown out to New York. Yeah, I got the head Island Def Jam, you know, with a stripper on his lap. Just, I mean, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. Right. Well, you know, and, and honestly, I, I think that it, it's reflective of the choices that you guys made because you, you know, frankly, use the system to your advantage of, like you said, investing in the, you know, ecosystem that will be the band from there on out to whether it's like, you know, investing in recording equipment, like all the yeah, things that yeah, you guys yeah. did. And like, that was, you know, not, not every band did that, <laughs> say, did that same, you know, took that same philosophy. And so, you know, and those bands are the ones that obviously, you know, break up after a couple of times. And, yeah, you know, and, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, different strokes for everybody, but that's, that's what needed to happen for us. And it was like, and, and it was just, uh, you know, at that point you don't, I mean, no one really knows, you know, it's like, you, there's no way to tell the future of, of what's going to happen to the band, <clears throat> you know, but it's like looking back on it, you know, all those little things that we did um, and just, uh, you know, the, the idea of, of always, you know, pushing through with everything you got before you quit, um, you know, it's just something that is, has just kept the band, uh, kept the band alive, man. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, I know you've been, you know, incredibly open about your, you know, mental health in regards to, you know, the ups and downs that most of us go through in life, you know, regardless if you play in a band or not. Um, and I, I I'm going to imagine that, you know, a, a lot of the trials and tribulations that you, uh, you know, felt with that were probably due, like you mentioned previously, you know, <laughs> the, uh, you know, uh, abusing substances in some capacity <laughs> throughout your life. Um, you know, how, I guess reflecting on that, how did you, uh, you know, were you able to kind of navigate that to get you to a spot where you are now, where, you know, ostensibly seems like you're, you know, in a much better place than you were, you know, five, 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, <clears throat> I think the, uh, the key for me is, has just been, uh, uh, you know, prioritizing stuff, you know, it's like, you get to the point where it's like, you know, like, what's more important, you know, like me getting fucked up or, you know, me being able to sing a whole tour and kick ass with my band, you know, like, so it's like, and then, and then that, you know, <clears throat> applying that outside of, of music, you know, like what's more important here, you know, like me just being a shithead or, you know, me being someone that, you know, uh, I can, you know, look at in the mirror and, you know, someone that my friends are stoked to call friends and someone who, you know, will be there for anybody and, and, and someone who won't be a flake and, and these things like that, that, that kind of, all these things kind of happen. If you, I think, at least for me, if you prioritize the wrong shit, you know, and it's like, for me, it took me a while to figure that out, you know, and it's like, uh, you know, there's other stuff too, though, man. It's like, sometimes, you know, it's like, you just get in, in, in a dark spot, you know, it's like, I think, uh, you know, artist life, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's super intense. If you're, I think the more kind of reflective and, and, and the more you have to dig, uh, within yourself to create art, um, you know, I mean, that's a dangerous place, man. That's a dangerous place. And, and for, uh, for a long time, that was really the only way I knew, um, you know, to, to the only well I had to like create something, you know, whether it's, you know, lyrically or, or, you know, physically on stage or whatever, um, you know, it was just a lot. And, and, you know, I, I was lost for a long time on that. And, and luckily, you know, I had bandmates and, and friends and family that, um, <clears throat> that, you know, were, were, that are amazing people and, and that were there, you know, through all of it with me. 
and and help me kind of figure it out because I, I it's you know I, I I am such a late bloomer when it comes to life you know it's like it's so crazy like uh you know like I'm I'm 42 years old now and I'm like I'm like literally like just figuring it out <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and that's all good that's all good man I mean that's that's just the way my life is I mean I've had I've had a fucking awesome life you know but it's like I think that you know just it's it's a like that's that's okay for me and it's okay for anyone going through that i mean it's like everybody's life and path is different and you know it took me a really long time to uh you know i i i took a lot of shit out on myself you know like i i i was i've been so hard on myself my whole life and you know there's just a, a lot of stuff that um, that I didn't need to put on myself that I was putting on myself. And that led to, you know, just not wanting to think about it. And that led to just wanting to get fucked up all the time, you know? And then if you're in, you know, a band and if you're in, uh, you know, you're on the road and you're in a spot where there's lots of drugs and there's lots of people that just want to fucking party. I mean, if you want to escape, you can fucking escape, you know? I mean, it, and it's just there, but, um, you know, reality doesn't really go anywhere, you know? So for me, uh, it was about just, um, you know, just really being like annoyed and just pissed off at the fact that, uh, I kept, you know, getting my priorities screwed up and I kept letting my friends down and I kept letting myself down. And so, um, you know, once I like kind of really, 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 started focusing on being the best singer I could be being the best bandmate I could be, um, you know, all that kind of translated into becoming a better person. Um, and, and, you know, since then it's been, it's been, uh, it's been an awesome, uh, you know, kind of road, you know, and I still, I mean, I'm, I, I'll, I'll still throw down with the best of them, you know, on, on, uh, on nights off or, uh, or, or whatever, maybe even nights on, but, uh, but it's just a different, space now i was able to kind of give myself a little breathing room and find some clarity mentally and um and just realize that uh that that i'm a good person you know and it's like i, I think that there's it's, it's hard to say that sometimes you know and it's it's a lot of people either lie to themselves or or you know they just can't say it and it's like i, I fought really really hard to be able to get to a spot where i can say that authentically um and and mean it and have it be the truth you know so um life's a trip man it's a gift and you know i'm I'm so fortunate to be able to uh to talk to you to tell stories about traveling and and playing music and getting fucked up and 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 living through it you know so it's like i've been through a lot of shit in my life and uh you know i'm stoked that i have a a, a platform however minimal it may be uh, to let people know that, that, that it's all good and that, you know, your mistakes don't have to define you. Your childhood doesn't have to define you. Um, uh, fuck it, man. Yesterday doesn't have to define you. You know, it, it's what you're doing in the present. And, um, you know, you got to find things that, that keep you in line. You know, it's like one of the things, uh, that I'll share with you that has been super huge for me is, you know, I, I, my dad died 10 years ago, uh, maybe even 11 years ago. And, uh, like I, you know, we, I live in Huntington beach and we, when he passed, we put his ashes out in the ocean and stuff like that. And, you know, having, you know, just the feeling, his feeling, his presence there, uh, is, is so huge for me because it's like a, uh, it's like a North star, you know, in a way where it's like, you know, like I go out, uh, on runs or if I'm, you know, working out or whatever outside on the beach, it's like, or if honestly, if I'm just sitting in my place and I'm getting frustrated or, or whatever, I can, I can, I go out and, uh, you know, there's a spot kind of just off of PCH where I can just stand there and I can just look out in the ocean and I can just talk to him. And it's, it's super cool. And I, you know, it's just like, it's just like a thing where, you know, I talk to him, I just obviously tell him I miss him, but you know, something that, you know, just, you know, please just continue to watch over me and, and keep me honest and keep me working hard and keep me focused. And, you know, don't let me, you know, let my friends down, let myself down, that type of shit. 
And if you can find something like that in your life, you know, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, a, a, a dead family member, you know, it can be anything, but it's, there, it's so important, I think, to have uh, some sort of accountability anchor, you know, and, and that, that's a, that's a big thing for me that keeps me, um, that keeps me, you know, focused and that keeps me on the right path. Cause honestly, it's so cool. You know, it's, it's so rad to be able to go out and have like real conversations with someone that isn't, you know, alive anymore that isn't here. Um, I, I do believe that there's so much, you know, more outside of this life, you know, um, obviously we've all lost people, but, I think that there's so much also, um, you know, strength that people can give to you um, and that you can give them, honestly, uh, you know, if they're not here physically, uh, they can still be for here for you in so many different ways. And, you know, my dad and I, we weren't the closest when when uh, when he was here. But, you know, before he passed, we were super close a couple of years uh, before he passed. And. And honestly, our, our relationship since he passed has just continued to grow um, just because of, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, anchor and, and, and kind of role that I've given him in my life as kind of a way for me to check in with myself and keep myself honest. So, um, you know, sometimes you got to get creative, you know, but I think, um, you know, accountability is, is a big a big, big fucking thing, man. It's like, I, I think that for guys, especially, you know, it's like you go through life. Sometimes you just, you just don't think that you got to be accountable for shit, you know? And it's like, and you got to be able to look within yourself first, um, you know, before you can judge anybody, before you can, you know, start to even really dive into anyone else's bullshit. You got to get your own house in order. And, uh, and for me, that's kind of a, that's, that's how I do it, you know? Yeah, no, that's 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 beautiful. Thanks for painting that picture. The holidays are descending upon us. Everyone is running around like crazy people trying to get their shopping done. Let me just solve that problem for you. No one is ever going to say no to this gift, and this gift is the Raycon wireless earbuds, headphones, or speakers. I love all of these products unequivocally. I use them every single day. And what makes them even cooler? They have 54 hours of battery life. They have a very comfortable fit. They will not fall out. I love them so much. They also have these rad holiday bundles. My personal favorite is the Audio Lover, which includes the everyday earbuds and the everyday headphones. So please, right now, go to buyraycon.com slash ray and use the code earlybf to get 20% off site-wide. That's 20% off of any Raycon product, which seriously never happens. Or you can save even bigger and get 30% off of Raycon's exclusive holiday bundles. That audio lover thing I was telling you about, do that. That's code earlybf at buyraycon.com slash ray for 20% off your Raycon purchase. Buyraycon.com slash ray and solve all of your holiday gift giving problems for your dad, your mom, your brother, sister. I don't care who, put it in their stocking. They will love you. Buyraycon.com slash ray, code earlybf. I love dogs so much. That's why I'm incredibly excited to welcome Embark on as a sponsor. They are a dog DNA testing kit. And what makes them cool is they scan for 215 genetic health risks across 350 breeds. And I want to give you $60 off and free shipping. So go to EmbarkVet.com, use the promo code Ray, and it unlocks that offer. And it also unlocks so many cool things that you can find out about your pup. And it's super easy. You get a little test tube with a Q-tip. You put it in the pup's mouth, send it back to Embark. They email you all of these results. It's very fast, easy, and I love doing it. 72% of pup parents are puzzled when it comes to their dog's breed. It's time to end these guessing games. This holiday season, give the dog lover in your life something they won't expect. The chance to decode their dog. It's the perfect time to shop for an Embark dog DNA test. Right now, Embark has a limited time offer on their breed and health kit and purebred kit for listeners of this show. Go to EmbarkVet.com to get free shipping and save $60 with promo code Ray. Visit EmbarkVet.com and use promo code Ray to save $60 today. Do it for your pup. The uh, few th- last things I want to hit on before I let you go. One of them, you know, speaking about uh, mariachi, mariachi El Bronx, I, I always think it's uh, 
been so interesting to watch the evolution of the band because, you know, since the get go, in my opinion, how you've tried to engage with, you know, clearly the, the fan base of the Bronx, but, but also encouraging people who are like, Hey, you may hate the Bronx, but you'll probably like this, like, and also, or also trying to get people who have never listened to mariachi music in general, listen to mariachi music because it's under, you know, the, uh, the context of coming from the Bronx. Like, you know, I, I guess what, uh, you know, I mean, you don't have to define what is the most, you know, the most special audience that, <laughs> you know, you're tapping into, but, you know, have you received feedback from kind of like both of those polar opposites where it's like, oh yes, like I hate the Bronx, but man, I love this. And then also people who are like hardcore mariachi fans and being like, Hey, you guys actually do this really, really well. So we appreciate this. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's dude, it's all over the spectrum. I mean, we, we have, you know, one of the funniest things was when, we did, uh, you know, a, a, a L Bronx opened up for the Bronx on a U.S. tour. I don't know when it was. It was, you know, I think it was on the second Mariachi record, something like that. But it was like, uh, uh, you know, there was a, an opener and then it was Mariachi L Bronx. And then there was a main support band that spanned Violent Soho. Uh, and then it was uh, then it was Bronx. And it was super funny because and especially as, you know, uh because for a while there el bronx was way more popular than the bronx i mean el bronx did like you know the late show with letterman and leno and conan twice i mean we were fucking all over the place for a while um so but and there were so many fans that would that would legitimately loved el bronx and had no fucking clue who the bronx was right and and, you know and then there was also like when we were doing those shows that we'd open for ourselves we'd open you know we'd play the el bronx and be fucking packed and then by the time the bronx would come out there'd be like you know you could tell like maybe like 70 or like 80 people left the room or whatever you know what i mean right so so it's definitely you know it's but that's what that's one of the things we love about it so much is just like the just the the weirdness of it and the specialty of it of being able to do both things and i mean now honestly the more we've been together there there's becoming like there's a little bit more crossover fusion musically between the bands um but you know for the most part for the longest time there was no crossover whatsoever um so it was just literally like these two completely different identities just the only thing in common was that you know the root of each band was the same people um and so you know the coolest thing that we got was the acceptance, you know, uh, from, uh, the Hispanic, uh, you know, music scene, uh, mariachi scene, um, you know, because obviously there was a lot of people talking shit when they figured out that we were going to try this. Um, a lot of people, you know, thought it was a joke that it was this, thought it was that. And, uh, you know, the first record came out and, you know, people really were inspired by it and dug it and got that it was like a a real thing. And it was made from love and appreciation of Hispanic music and culture. And they got that. And then when the second record came out, uh, it was just like it, it was just like, boom, it was just like, you know, lights out, man. I mean, that record took us all over the world. We're playing with the Foo Fighters, the Killers, all this crazy shit. Uh, and it was, um, uh, it was an insane experience, you know, but it was always the, the most, the thing I'm most proud of with El Bronx is the legitimacy of it, you know, that it's, that it's been, uh, that it gets the nod from, from musicians and, and, uh, from, from different cultures all over the world. And it, it's something that is really cool. Like you're saying, you know, diehard Bronx fans who have never heard an unplugged guitar in their life, you know? like discovering a whole new genre of music and then discovering like a whole new culture, you know, like that's something that is insanely rewarding. And I'm not saying that we've done that on like a global level, but I know for a fact we've done that on a small level. Cause I've talked to a lot of motherfuckers who have said, Hey man, like I- I'm so blown away by the world that El Bronx has introduced me to you know, I found all these great bands and they, all these different things and all these different cultural aspects that they're checking out. And it's super cool. You know, that's that's super rad. So the fact that we can be that kind of vehicle, um, you know, is 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 an honor, you know, and it's like, um, you know, I'm, lo- I'm looking forward to obviously we're going to be pretty Bronx heavy here for the next probably two years. But we're, we're just now kind of starting to 
to write and and start the process for the big uh for the big l bronx comeback record because uh <laughs> nice it's, it's yeah, time it's yeah it's time it's time we're getting we're getting warmed up we're in the bullpen yeah that's good <laughs> <laughs> uh the so where does your relationship with tour kind of stand now i mean i know the the last year of being off the road like you know not speaking about that but mostly speaking about the you know ebb and flow of people's relationship with the idea that you know at the beginning of tour in your touring life it's exciting everything's exciting and then it kind of gets into you know that habit that habitual oh the, i don't really want to be gone 300 days out of the year and all that sort of stuff so ha- have you always enjoyed touring or did you have you know battles with it where it's like well i know i have to do this but uh you know I, i'd rather not <laughs> you know like how has that evolved with you yeah i mean i've i've always i've always loved it you know i think there was definitely a point for us um, and I think that it happens uh, with a lot of punk rock bands or, or just bands that are kind of in that mid-level range um, is when uh, we, we, you know, we kind of had to make a decision or not a decision, but it was like a strategic way of thinking where, you know, we kind of woke up one day and realized that we were just kind of touring ourselves in circles, you know, and it was like, um, you know, you, you're playing the same clubs, to the same people, to the same uh, you know, in, in the same cities and, and, and you're kind of just on this hamster wheel, you know, and, and you don't really, it takes a while to realize it sometimes because it's so fucking fun. I mean, you're playing music every fucking night and you're traveling the world and it's, you're with your fucking best friends and it's the fucking best life ever. But if you can get to a point, um, where, you know, and obviously now, you know, older we get, you know, guys got families and stuff like that. So, you know, we've, we still tour, you know, probably more than, than most bands, but for us, um, we really, you know, started looking at it strategically as far as like, okay, like, let's not just tour to tour anymore. Like, let's make sure one, it makes sense financially Two, it makes sense strategically. Um, you know, and, and, you know, we're going to go out and, and we're going to do, uh, whatever we can, um, you know, as long as it is that checks those two boxes, you know, and it's like, um, you know, that's something that honestly brought a lot more, uh, you know, levity to, to the overall kind of, you know, balance of the band, because we were just touring like maniacs. And when you do that, you know, it's like, one, it's like at some point you got to take a break, you know, and that's why, you know, COVID was a, a blessing in disguise for us because, you know, a lot of bands in our level, you want to take a break and strategically you should take a break because you need to give people, you know, a rest and you need to give them time to like refill their, their, their charge to come see you and sing along and, 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 and freak out. You know, it's like, if they can see you, you know, three times in a year, every year, it's like eventually, you know, even the most diehard of fans is, is going to be like, fuck enough, you know? <laughs> so, totally. um, so you gotta, you know, you, you gotta take a break, but uh, sometimes, you know, with, you know, touring is, is the lifeblood for a lot of fucking bands, you know? So you, you tour in circles and you, you tour to tour because that's how the fucking paychecks keep coming in, you know? Yep. So it's a super, it's a super delicate, uh, balance and, and it's, it's really, really hard, uh, to strategize, um, you know, on kind of a, uh, a punk rock budget, you know, but it's like, it was something that we kind of started doing uh, a couple years before the pandemic. And then honestly, with the pandemic hit, uh, it was devastating, you know, for the world. Um, uh, but from a, a Bronx standpoint, uh, it was a really good thing for us because we weren't going to be able to take a break on our own. And so the world kind of shutting down um, allowed us to kind of reset and 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 get some much needed rest and also just kind of, uh, you know, reprioritize and strategize for the new record and just get a, like a lot of, you know, like, OK, like, fuck, you know, here's the deal. Like, we're not going out anytime soon. So, you know, let's circle the wagons and figure out, you know, what's working, what's not working where we want to go, what we want to do. And, uh, and we really, you know, use this time off to, to really, really, um, you know, kind of dive into the details of the band and, and kind of clean our house up, 
um, and and figure out what we want to do with this record and and kind of map out you know the next kind of ten years of of what we wanted to do you know loosely and then so we can kind of start filling in um, filling in the details on that you know as we kind of as we you know approach it we're trying to be like two three years out now with like ballpark plans and then like you know stay you know at least hopefully a year ahead of the game uh but usually it's like you know six months and sometimes it's like six days ahead of the game it's so hard you know no matter how much you game plan as something's always going to be last minute but that's just the, the nature of the beast but um you know i can't i like we got this tour coming up with dropkick murphys and rancid and it's our first tour back and man, I can't fucking wait. I cannot wait. But it's like it feels it like that tour feels right. You know what I mean? Like that's a badass tour. You know, we're going out. It's going to be fucking awesome places. It's going to be great crowds. Uh, we got a new record coming out August 27th. So that all makes sense. You know, so it's like I think, you know, for us, you know, being a band, you know, we're coming up on, uh, you know, for 20 years here eventually. I mean. First, right. record, first record came out in 03, but the band started in 02. So next year, you know, we'll be, we'll be turning 20, you know? So it's like, you know, we just got to be a little bit uh, smarter about what we do uh, to our bodies and to our, uh, you know, just, just, I guess the band, you know? So we, we kind of just look at it a little differently now, I guess. Um, but the energy and the, the, like the joy of touring, of traveling. And like, dude, I've always loved every single aspect of it. Like shitty load-ins, fucking flight delays, uh, you know, fucking, you know, we, one time we fucking flew all the way to London and we got there, we threw all our fucking bags in these fucking cabs. We have fucking gear. We had all this shit. We get dropped off and the fucking, it turns out the fucking hotel was a total fraud. We got ripped off, didn't even exist. And we're standing there on the side of the road in London, like a goddamn fucking music video with all our gear on the sidewalk and fucking, you know, and it's like even moments like those, it's just like, like that, like that's what it is to be in a band, you know, like that's just what it is. You can't, you can't, if you can't like appreciate those moments, uh, you know, then, then you don't really deserve it. You know, it's, it's like, I, like those are the things that, that I love. Um, obviously, you know, of course I love playing shows. I love all the good shit too. I mean, that's a no brainer, but it's like, it, it's, it, you, you gotta be in love with all of it. You know, like I, I really do believe that in order to, in order to want to do it, um, you know, for the rest of your life or for any really, you know, sustained amount of time, you gotta be in love with all of it. And, and I am, and, and we are. And so, uh, I can't wait to get back out on the road. Honestly, I can't fucking wait. Yeah, no, that's sick. Uh, last thing, the it seems like you guys try to execute, you know, with like pre-orders and you know vinyl variants and all this stuff. You guys try to execute like a bunch of ridiculous ideas, and I mean that very affectionately. <laughs> it's like, hey, wow, let's do this, you know, really, really, you know, insane vinyl package or whatever. Is that just really, really fun for you to try to bring these, you know, harebrained schemes to life, or you know, is yeah. that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the best. I mean, honestly, that and that's the thing. By that's what I'm talking about. By like, you gotta love all of it because it's like, you know, like, like you know, like, like we run our shop through our buddy Bo, who has like a merch company. But it's us. Like we basically just like use his stuff and like you know, like I'm like me and Ken are are shipping out the seven inches and and the boxes and you know, Bo's helping where he can and he's printing shirts and stuff like that. And it's super DIY and super in-house, but it's like, you know, like there's so many ways you can, you know, so many people get pissed off about the music business, you know, they get, they're just over it. They're just like, fuck the music business, fuck Spotify, fuck record labels, you know, fuck everybody. It's, it's, and, and I get it. I mean, I, I get it. It's like, they're, you know, they're like the uh, financial value of a song is fucking, you know, the, what people, you know, would pay for a song and what people, the respect that music gets for what people, what the artist puts into it and the amount of work that goes into it is, 
you know, borderline insulting, you know, but it's like, like, like what the fuck are you going to do about it? You know, like what, like, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to fucking, are you going to, you know, take all your music off Spotify, you know, like congratulations. Like now no one can hear your shit, you know, now no one can find your band. Now no one, like you just gotta, you know, you gotta, it's like fucking Ray Liotta says in Copland, you gotta fucking move diagonal. You know, you just gotta find a different fucking lane. You know, and it's like, like creativity doesn't have to just live and die uh, in the song. You know, it it, it can it can stretch itself out to everything you do as a band, as an artist, the bands you tour with, uh, how you release a record, the merch that you put together. You know, it's like it. The more you dive into the whole process, the more rewarding it gets, and the more you find yourself finding creative solutions for shit that normal people don't find creative solutions for. And if you can do something cool and send that to your fans, your fans will eat it up and they'll reward you because all they want to do is support you. Like they, they like your art. They like your band. They go see you play. So anytime that you pour creative energy into something that's for them, it's always going to pay off. You know, it's like, and, and, and so, you know, that was a big part of this record campaign and a big part of, this last kind of year of looking under the hood um, was just really, you know, taking, um, you know, the creative reins over everything that we do, you know, like outside of, outside of just writing a record, you know, it's like, let's, let's really dive into how we release this thing. Let's really dive into all the awesome people that we've met over the last 20 years of this band and collaborate with them to create some really cool releases over all these different songs we have on the record. You know, let's put out, you know, a fucking NFT. Let's fucking make a beer pong table. Let's fucking, you know, like who the fuck cares? Like there's no, there's no rules anymore. There's, there's absolutely no rules. And if people don't buy it, they don't buy it. You know, it, right. it's all, we won't make all, it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's all good. You know, like it's, it's totally cool. So, um, for us, it's been a super rewarding, um, you know, thing just diving into all this stuff. And honestly, our our fans fucking love it, and it's cool. And I get some of it is just like you know, <coughs> beyond you know, like you know, the other day Ken and I are sitting in the shop, and you know we're fucking putting you know beer pong packs together, and we got cups and fucking ping pong balls, and we're just la- la- laughing our asses off. You know, we got. We put out this beer with this uh, with Fall Brewing and our friends from San Diego, and it, it's it's funny, you know. But it's like it's also it's fucking fun, you know. And it's like that's the thing. It's like you can't, you know, you can't let the fucking industry beat you down. You can't let it win. You can't let you can't fold to technology. You can't be one of these old fucks. It's just like I don't like it anymore, you know. Like it, it like that's just not us. Like we don't want to do that. And it's so important to us that we, you know, maintain the creativity and we maintain the fucking fun, man. Music is supposed to be fun. You know, art is supposed to be fun. Life is supposed to be fun, you know, and, and a lot of it, so much of it is what you put in is what you get out. So, um, we, you know, we apply that to everything we do. Yeah, for sure. No, it comes, it it comes through crystal clear. So Matt, Thank you for hanging, dude. I appreciate uh, going all these different places that I threw you to. So thank you. Yeah, man. All good, man. Appreciate the conversation. And again, thanks for uh, thanks for rescheduling. I appreciate it. Yes, men and women of this podcast listening universe. Thank you for, um, yeah, checking out this, this particular conversation. I love Matt. Love him. Uh, can I say that again? I love him. But shout out to Matt for making this happen. Shout out to Monica, publicist extraordinaire for hooking this up. And um, yeah, check out their new record. It's uh, dropping, or it's it's dropped. Just listen to it, okay? You can find it on every streaming platform available, and you know how to access music. You're smart. You are listening to podcasts. So what do we have next week? I have another great conversation. I just get so excited to paint with this really broad brush of guests that are on the show. Adam D. from Kill Switch Engage and Times of Grace. We hung out on the uh, the computers and we had a conversation and it was grand because I got to talk to him about Aftershock <laughs> and all these random things that he hasn't thought about for, you know, 15, 20 years. It's great. That's what we got next week. And um, yeah, until then, please be safe, everybody. 
Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. The world of chocolate has been turned upside down. A very unusual situation. You saw the stacks of cash in our office. Chocolate comes from the cacao tree. And recently, varieties of cacao, thought to have been lost centuries ago, were rediscovered in the Amazon. There is no chocolate on earth like this. Now some chocolate makers are racing deep into the jungle to find the next game-changing chocolate. And I'm coming along. Okay, that was a very large crocodile. Listen to Obsessions of Wild Chocolate on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Mo Rocca, and I'm back with season three of my podcast, Mobituaries. I've dug up even more stories about the people and things that fascinate me. From the fruit that once scandalized... The shape of the banana made it taboo. ...to the band that played second banana to the Beatles. They were lucky to come in second, and the truth is they only came in second for about two months. Listen to Mobituaries on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.